we have Mohammad Solman Daud is showcasing the fun lab, reaching the unreachable. Solman has a decade of work experience in the field of science communication and engagement, and is considered as one of the pioneers in the field of field in this field in Egypt. Um, his career in science communication started as an outreach uh, teaching assistant at the American University in Cairo, where he spent two years managing a variety of STEM engagement activities and citizen science projects across uh, Egypt. Uh, he also worked as a science communication specialist and currently as a communication and development officer at the American University in Cairo, where he works on numerous uh, community led projects. Um, to break the wall between science and society. Um, hi, Solomon, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, it is lovely to be here. Um, and thank you for the invitation. And um, it's quite an honor and I'm humbled to be among all of these um, uh, like um, like quality speakers here. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my project, uh, the Fun Lab, uh, where I'm currently working right now. Let's start uh, with a video, um, and hopefully you can see the video without any interruptions. <laughs> The Egyptian Agency for Public Mobilization and Statistics found out the number of science higher education graduates is way down the bottom compared to theoretical colleges graduates. So we tackle it down to find out in the underprivileged communities, parents are pushing their kids away from the science track at their high school. And that's, of course, the reason behind the science education imbalance in these different communities. So that's the problem we need to tackle it. Somebody help us. Our project is an open space activity where all ages can be educated about science. It's a mobile facility through our science bus that can travel across the country to spark the curiosity of young generations. To achieve that, we are delivering science shows, planetarium shows to underprivileged communities all over Egypt, using our planetarium, the first of its kind here in Egypt. We are working to change the perception, the attitudes, towards science to be more positive and to change the misconception that science is boring and hard and difficult. And that's what allows us to inspire kids and young generation to explore more avenues for creativity. What surprised me the most, especially with the underprivileged communities, is the tremendous hunger for knowledge that you can see on the faces of the children and through their actions as it's something they have never seen before. Another thing that we receive a lot of calls from teachers telling us that the students who attended our shows actually considering a career in science fields. <laughs> Our ultimate goal is to break the wall between science and society and achieve education equality by reaching out to the unreachable. So um, I think this video, the, the, the two minutes video summarized the whole thing about our project. Uh, but the idea itself began, uh, begun in, in 2007 uh, with a physics professor here at the American University in Cairo. So um, like he thought like the way of teaching students, even university students is not the best way of uh, like in, in terms of like uh, education um, techniques. And that's why he, uh, proposed an idea to have like a lab and he called it the fun lab just the so the fun lab passed through different kind of stages of development so I'm going to talk about the timeline of the fun lab right now um, so it is started in uh, 2007 with a European fund it's called Tempus and the basic idea to have a laboratory that belongs to the physics department at the American University in Cairo and the main target audience back then was the uh, the AUC communities themselves so I mean like we uh, the, the, the physics major students at the School of Science and Engineering and 
even non-major science students all over the campus. Uh, basically, to attract more students to adopt science majors and especially physics. And then uh, we expanded our um, impact to reach out to different international schools all around the area in, in Cairo. And then back in 2010, we decided to go even further to include all the international schools all over the country. And back in 2013, and this is when I joined um, the university, we worked on different projects that I'm going to talk about later. So let me introduce, um, firstly, I'm sorry, I have to do that. Um, so this is the fun lab. This is the laboratory I talked about. It's basically a lab that has a lot of uh, demonstration. It is considered like a nucleus of a small science center here uh, at the American University in Cairo. Because in Egypt, we don't have any science centers all over the country. So that was basically, you can safely say it's the first kind of like science center uh, here in Egypt. And this is what we call the spinatory. It's a spinning laboratory uh, where we can explain uh, like physical physical terminologies like um, Coriolis effect. It's rotating, as you can see, uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise, and we explain um, uh, the Coriolis effect uh, with the uh, rotating reference backgrounds. And then we have other shows, we call it Wonders of Science Show, and this is part of the international school that visited our university. And we bring schools to our university and we reach them out in their universities as well. Uh, so basically, uh, this is what we do back in 2007 to 2010. And then uh, in 2010, 11, 2013, uh, we had to explore more, to reach out to more uh, international schools, as I mentioned. And beside doing some public engagement with the public regarding the cutting edge technology research that is going on by researchers at the American University in Cairo. Why we do that? Why public engagement? For Why it doesn't matter for, for any academic institution? I mean, for three reasons, ac accountability, trust, and uh, research relevance. Because like when you talk to the public about what you do at the university, what kind of research we do, because after all, the university is funded by the taxpayers and they want to know where their money goes. And when you talk about the kind of research that you do at the university, this is going to increase the trust, the accountability of what you do. And uh, because like public engagement is a two way of communication, it's not just a deficit model, it's not just one way of communication. So that can bring the voice of the public. So they can actually contribute to the scientific process itself through citizen science project and through like um, com some kind of discussions together. So uh, starting from 2013, this is where I joined the university. So we worked on a project called IC, which is Interdisciplinary Science Education's Enhancement. And basically the goal of the project based on a survey uh, that was done by the Bayer NSF uh, that asked scientists who are interested in science why, <clears throat> why they are interested and um, they put the top five reasons uh, all six reasons for that. And most of the reasons, as you can see, is all about uh, engagement while there were children, like playing with science stores, visiting science centers, museums, maybe doing experiments at homes and stuff like that. So experimental learning was a, a key word here. So, and this brings me to differentiate between formal science education and informal science education. So, uh, Science communication in Egypt is relatively new, and a lot of, we we face one of the big challenges that we face that people tend to uh, categorize science communication and informal science education with the same bubble as formal science education, but they are completely different. For instance, formal science education is curriculum based uh, in the national education system, uh, maybe to get a certificate or to get like. Um, uh, like, like a graduation, postgraduate certificate as well. And, but for the informal science education, it's different. It's learning about science outside the education system. It's not bounded by an, a specific area in a classroom. It's not bounded by any rules. There is no curriculum here. <clears throat> and formal science education is about 20% of working hours. And the rest, 80%, you can do informal science education. And this is a table that can show you uh, lots more differences between these 
the former informal education and formal education. But the key word here is informal education is not bounded by a curriculum. It's not bounded by place. You can do it in the streets. You can do it even in uh, religious places like churches, mosques and stuff like that and temples. You can do it anywhere. Uh, you can do it like in, at home, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So how we teach our students what kind of approach that we use when it comes to teaching. So as you know, learners use what the original to construct new understandings, understandings based on uh, Casey Southworth's words. And for instance, when you bring them new knowledge, uh, they evaluate the knowledge. Does it fit with their knowledge? If yes, that means it's going to broaden your knowledge. If no, there's three, three scenarios here. Whether they're going to refine knowledge or they're going to reject this knowledge or they're going to hold two views of different context here. And that's why we use for our, most of our shows and most of our workshops, we use inquiry-based learning. Because like I believe that kids are born scientists. They have this curiosity in them already embedded in their DNA. So uh, rather than tell them, we guide them, we support them to find the, the answer themselves through like different kind of interactive activities. So we scaffolding using questions. So we build like science in terms of blocks and we try to discover, discover and explore block by block. And so we ask questions to get answers out of them, to guide them to, um, to like to find the right answer to, to teach them about critical thinking and design thinking process as well. So, and then in 2016 and 2019, we worked on another project with the Ministry of Education and the uh, ag governmental organization called SRT, which is, stands for Academy of Scientific Research and Technology. And basically they have 10 regional centers distributed all around Egypt to cover all the 28 governorates of Egypt. And uh, the premise of the project mainly was to go there and deliver our shows and our uh, activities to schools where they visit uh, while they visit the regional center and then we had a brilliant idea why we cannot we can duplicate our equipment here at the fun lab and we send them like uh, all of this equipment to all the 10 regional science centers all over the country and then we turn all of these regional centers into science centers and this is what we managed to do and uh, we basically we need more teachers and more science communicators that's why we give psychom training Trainings for all, for most of the staff members that work that already working at the regional centers who are from science backgrounds. So we give them some kind of science uh, uh, communication and public engagement trainings so they can actually uh, deliver all our shows back then at the regional centers. So we turn it, all of these regional centers into science centers. And um, then back in 2019 and 2020, and like it's still running project and it's going to be end in 2022. And uh, basically we have a science bus and this is science bus basically to promote the idea that science is for all. Because here in Egypt, people, the majority consider science as a luxury rather than a necessity. They consider science is uh, hard. Uh, like 70% of our school students, uh, they prefer to choose uh, social and humanities track rather than science track. And this is like a big thing here in Egypt, the big issue that we need to tackle down. So basically we have this kind of project with a nonprofit charity organization called MAK. We, the, the premise of the project is to reach out to all the marginalized, the underserved communities all around Egypt to spark their curiosity about science. Um, so we do a lot of uh, shows uh, for them. But um, so now I'm going to talk about all of the shows that I, I really am talking about. Uh, what are our tools and activities? First, we use themed shows and we call them Wonders of Science shows. And uh, we do our workshops as well. We use planetarium shows. We use planetary shows, the thing that I talked about earlier. And we do STEM camps every year where we invite uh, 250 students every year to come to our campus here and we teach them different themes every year. So for instance, and this is what these two pictures from the first uh, STEM camp that we held here at the American University in Cairo. It was about engineering design process, process. So we teach children how to think like an engineer, how to construct stuff and how to be, maybe the next year we had like something we call career uh, uh, camp uh, where they can be a scientist, an engineer, uh, an astronomer, uh, a, a doctor, a physician and stuff like that. And, uh, but during the COVID-19, the current pandemic, and we had a lot of challenges. And 
in order to overcome all of these challenges, I had to categorize our audience into four main categories. So we have people with the luxury of internet access, and we reach them out through different channels, social media channels. We reach, out, reach, reach them out through Facebook, because Facebook is the, the main thing here, the main social media platform here in Egypt. We reach them out through TikTok, and this is mainly to uh, target the the, the, the young generation, what would they call it? The Z generation, the Z generation. And we reach them out through YouTube as well. So they are the three main social media platforms to do sign shows and workshops. We had Zoom workshops as well and uh, more active, more online activities for all the people who has access to the internet. But how about people with only multimedia devices without any internet access? How are we going to reach them out? So we reach out to our sponsor, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a non-charity, uh, um, sorry, a non-profit organization, charity organization called Masrukhi, M-A-K, and they do door-to-door -door, like supplies back, and we ask them to tag our CD, the CD of our best videos and TV and workshops and stuff like that, and they de deliver our CD door-to-door -to, -door to the under Soviet communities. And uh, with people without any of the above, they don't have multimedia devices. They don't have internet access. So we had to reach them out through their neighborhood. So we go there and we do the show in the street. Why are they watching from their balconies? And we call it Signs from Balconies. And we have uh, other audience. They have TV in their houses, but they don't have internet. They don't have multimedia devices. So we had some kind of collaboration with the TV local channel. And we depicted the first TV shows for uh, for kids. And one of them is running right now. I'm working on it right now with, uh, with a media agency here in Egypt. It's the channel is called Madras Setna TV, which is running by the Ministry of Education. And so what is next? Uh, so the next step for the Fun Lab, I think maybe after the two 2022, after the end of the Science Bus project, is to go and build the first national science museum in Egypt. And luckily, uh, Egypt right now is going toward building new uh, capital here in Egypt. And uh, we have some kind of uh, like initial agreement with the government to, uh, to, to, to have like the first national science museum in Egypt. Uh, and I think this is the promising project uh, in the future. That's wonderful. You've come a long way with uh, vibrant um, events and engagement activities, uh, especially uh, being very conscious about uh, what kind of audience that you would want to address, uh, the reachable and the unreachable. Thank you so much for sharing um, your journey.